Hey guys, it's Doc. Boy, was that a large stack of comics. Normally, I pick up, as far as new books, I try to keep my stack to about three to four books a week. But uh, this week was almost ten books. So, I'm not going to do a top ten or anything like that. But let's go ahead and get started talking about these books because I've got a lot to talk about in a short amount of time. Alright, so the first book up that we're going to talk about is Issue 2 of The Nice House by the Sea by James Tenyon IV, Alvaro Martinez Bueno, and Jordi Belair from DC Black Label. So this picks up where Issue 1 left off of Nice House by the Sea. And the difference between Nice House on the Lake and the Nice House by the Sea appears to be that the people in the Nice House by the Sea went willingly whereas the people by the nice house on the lake had no idea what was going on. Walter, in that series, started by friending people, but Walter was an alien, and Walter ended up picking ten people that he fell in love with over the course of his quote-unquote life, you know, through high school, college, things like that. A life that was totally and completely fabricated. So, um, you know... That one, that house was built on a lie. He did what he did because he loved those people, but that house was built on a lie. This house seems to be much more open, and uh, these people know what's going on to a certain extent, and they know that they were chosen, so they feel like they're special. Um, the artwork in this book is just as beautiful in a watercolor painted style as volume one, the nice house on the lake was. So you always get a very clear sense of who the characters are. It gives you a breakdown in this particular issue of who the artist is. And then you have the pianist, you know, so you get an idea of who these characters are. You don't have to really guess, but at the same time you do get a little bit of this exposition, you know, uh, Hickman esque sort of thing. And then you get a dog show up, and you're trying to figure out what the, the deal is with a dog, because they never really had that before. So it gives them something to be centered on. It gives them something to, you know, love on in this case but they're still trying to figure out where did this dog come from because, you know, who ordered a dog? Because that was the deal with the nice house on the lake is you could order whatever it was that you wanted to make you happy because the world had ended and Walter wanted his friends, his loved ones, to be happy. So they were able to order in um, the, the one that always sticks out to me, of course, in, in I think the first issue when they first started to understand what was going on is uh, one of the characters' lists had a copy of Action Comics number one, parentheses, The Real Deal, and uh, Detective Comics number 27, also The Real Deal, not a replica. So, not a facsimile. And uh, so I thought that was pretty funny little, you know, tie-in that, uh, you know, Easter egg that they had pop up in the first volume. But here, we're trying to figure out... All of these characters have history, just like in the first volume. They all have a backstory that ties in together. Um, and so here there's a storm raging outside, and whoever's trying to control the storm says, I, I, I can't seem to gain control of it. I, you know, what's going on here? And so it seemed to be a vortex situation, and these two characters here are going to go check out exactly what's going on with this freak lightning. So, really a good, strong, solid issue with a lot of characterization and a lot of world building here that also harkens back and ties back in with Volume 1, The Nice House on the Lake. So, I can't wait to read more of this. I hope to God there's not any breaks in the, the publishing schedule on this like there was in the, the first volume because... I've gotten to the point where I'm, uh, honestly, I'm reading so much and I've, I've gotten older now, so it's hard to follow those stories month to month to month, whereas when I was reading uh, Spider-Man and Thor and maybe Avengers back in 1998, 
it was easy to keep up with those because I was reading three to four books and they were all superhero books and they were large and bombastic and it was just full of action and adventure each month. Now that I've started reading a bunch of uh, DC black label books and independent books, then it gets much more difficult to follow because these characters are not as one dimensional as superhero books can be. Now I'm not saying they all are, but I'm saying as they can be. Speaking of independent books, we have issue four of seven of Grommets from Image Comics, written by Rick Remender and Brian Posan, with art by Brett Parsons. So this continues the story of 1985. And our main protagonist here gets a phone call and... It is a friend of his, Samra, and she's kind of hanging out at her house, her parents' house or whatever, watching TV, watching uh, MTV, and she digs on him. She digs on uh, the main character. But as we see, as the story progresses, he gets, he gets rather upset because he's going to he's going to move his father is moving the family to phoenix and so he's just built these relationships with his friends and samra likes him and there's so much going on and now they're about to watch escape from New York. So, it's a slice of life from 1985. You've got you've got the punk rock guys over here and the skater boys and then you've got, you know, there's always like the cool older sister or the cool, you know, cousin and then you've got Samra here. And so these characters are all brought to life like I was just talking about. It's almost like they really existed. It's it's almost autobiographical rather than just being a comic book. Instead, this gives you a slice of life of what 1985 looked like. Um, VCR tapes were a big deal, um, and I never experienced that, but I had some friends, you know, in, in college that had been army brats, and their mom or their dad or both had moved them around multiple, multiple times over the years. And it's hard to keep building relationships when you don't really know how long those relationships are going to be around for. It's hard to say, you know, well, this guy likes me or this girl likes me. And, and you know, all of a sudden, you're moving to a new city. So the new, you know, the, the main character here is trying to grow up. He's trying to find his way in this world. And none of it makes sense. That's what I deal with a lot in psych, is that sometimes I'm dealing with adolescents. And they're just trying to find their place in life. And a lot of parts of life are moving around them. And they're revolving around them rather than asking for their input or giving them a chance to give input. So, I think this is one of the coolest things that's come out from Image in a long time. I think Image is doing a lot of books now that are swinging for the fences for something different other than superheroes. And this one is definitely an A+, and knocks it out of the park. So, we've got issue 5, 6, and 7 to go to see how the story concludes. All right. We have the massive Amazing Spider-Man Legacy number 950, also known as issue 56 of this particular run by Zeb Wells, John Romita Jr., and Scott Hanna on inks. And this has got one main story with Romita Jr. in it on the art. And I normally don't, I really normally don't complain about Romita Jr.'s artwork. And I don't know if it was perhaps because it was rushed or what's going on. But 
why is that golem instead of tombstone? In this panel, you get a big adult head and body and shoulders. And even here, you get the same thing. But here, the proportions are just a little bit off. I'm going to leave it be because, like I said, I really like Romita Jr.'s artwork, and I'm not trying to knock the man. And I understand that sometimes, you know, when you do a big book like this, that you've got a lot riding on it. And plus, he's, he's out after four more issues. So he's probably looking towards other things to try to move forward. I'd still like to see a Daredevil run with Romita Jr. on as, as artist because those covers that he's been doing on Daredevil seem to be just bangers. So this story was not terrible. This story introduces what's going to be the final fight of this run anyway uh, between Tombstone and Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. Now, Tombstone doesn't know that Spider-Man and Peter Parker are one, but he's going to... He, he intends to kill Parker to send a message to Spider-Man because Spider-Man has been going around town um, trying to make everybody think that they are, you know, old good old buddies, old pals to disrupt Tombstone's new status as the practically as the kingpin of New York who controls all five boroughs and controls all of the, uh, you know, various mafia districts. Or should I say Magia? Um, but it was a good title. It was a good, solid title. I've always thought that the first five issues that Zeb opened up with were street level, and they were very strong. They were really good um, stories. But after that, he kind of lost his way. And I don't know if it was relationship issues. I don't know if it was the fact that he had to do two books a month on, on here. And that can be hard to, that can be a lot to write. And that means you've got to write ahead a lot. But that also means that you have to plot ahead quite a while out. So, like I've said before, I just wish that they would go back to a once a month on ASM. I understand that they're racing, racing towards a thousand issues. But I would rather them put out one issue a month and take another four years to get to issue 1000, to give me something to look forward to, and actually have a good story by the time they get there. So, this is the beginning of the end for Wells and Ramita Jr. on ASM, but I really hope that this is not the end of Ramita Jr. on ASM. I would like to see him come back and do at least one more run, even if it's for six issues. I'd like to see him come back on the title one more time before he retires. So, I think it's great. I wasn't real fond of the price, um, even though it is an oversized legacy issue. But $8 for this was quite a bit steep. Um, it did have some backup stories in the back of it, but I didn't take the time to read those. My main interest is to see how this Tombstone story plays out. Okay, next up we have Void Rivals issue 12. And the big shock thing that was going to be about this issue is that Salak and Salila, who are the main characters of this title since issue one, were supposed to go their separate ways. Oh, no! But why? And just like Kirkman of old, when he was writing Walking Dead, he provides that emotional punch. And it's not that she's leaving because she doesn't care about him. It's not that she's leaving because there's nothing more to say. She's leaving because they've discovered a secret, you know, so big and so vast that... I'm sorry about the glare, guys. Um, a secret so big and so vast that they both have to go their separate ways to tell their own um, races of people on their own planets, about it. They can't go together. We've already seen what happens when, you know, she tried to bring him along at the beginning of the series, and they pretty much locked him up as a prisoner and treated him terribly, just because he looked different than they do. 
But what's funny is he doesn't look that much different. Um, but the but the last page that was on this in this book was quite of a shocker. Um, I'm not gonna sh- I'm not gonna show it and reveal it, but somebody's trying to wake up, and it doesn't show who. It doesn't show what. But that could change the course of this entire series if this mysterious sleeper character were to arise. But I'm really glad that back at issue 7, which if you've been following the channel for a while, I thought about dropping the book after issue 7. But I'm really glad that I've stuck it out. Um, Kirkman and Dave Felici make a hell of a team. The, uh, the artwork in here is full of energy. And it doesn't look like Dave Felici is getting tired of drawing the book or that he'll move on anytime soon. There's plenty of action. There's plenty of suspense. There's uh, Skuck's Away again. But, like I said, there's emotion and there's care between these two characters, even though they were sworn enemies in the, in the beginning. But I really like what Kirkman has done. This book was meant to build the entire Energon universe of Transformers and G.I. Joe titles together, minus uh, G.I. Joe Real American Heroes, still written by Larry Hama. But this helps to build this universe into one that everybody can enjoy because we've seen Transformers in the series. We've seen two different new races now that we didn't know about that live in this particular universe and coexist with the Transformers. So... I think this title is fresh as far as ideas and where it's going. So I'm in it for the long haul, and as long as Kirkman and Dave Felici want to work on this title, I'm definitely going to keep picking it up. I told you folks it's a big stack this week. All right, Ultimate X-Men number six. We finally have, and this is by Peach Momoko as writer and artist, we finally have Armor confront the Shadow King. And he learns from the cult that he's pretty much a uh, part of, called the Children of the Atom, oddly enough. He learns how to control these shadows. He learns how to make people see what he sees, and more importantly, make them believe what he sees is their reality. So, and he made his mom happy, which that's kind of a really creepy image if you really think about it but he's in shadow form but that's his power so you have you know maystorm and armor and the team the loose you know ultimate x-men team going against this shadow king figure so it is nice to see a little bit of action in the book because so much of the original three or four issues of this, people were like, this is not X-Men. This is just Peach Momoko telling some sort of weird anime story. It's just like Ultimate Spider-Man. It has to build the world. You're building something from nothing. And so I really have enjoyed this title so far. There's... A lot of people out there that didn't really give it a chance, I don't think. And I think that at the end of the day, they'll come to find themselves sad because they missed out on something that was really beautiful, really well thought out, and awesomely constructed. Because I think it's, I, I think it's one of the best titles that Marvel is putting out in the Ultimate Universe besides Ultimate Spider-Man at this point. So, long live Peach Momoko on Ultimate X-Men. Okay, next up is the final... Uh, issue of the five-parter of shorts, you know, one and duns, talking about Erica Slaughter and Something is Killing the Children, issue 40. Again, by James Tenyon IV, Werther Del Adera as the artist, and Mikhail Muerto. So, the last, you know, from 36 through 40 has been showing the history of Erica Slaughter and who she is and some of the cases in short form that have made her who she is as a character herself. That's pretty cool color on that page. I like that. Um, 
but here she is talking to Aaron, and he's trying to explain to her, you know, hey, this is this is what created, you know, who I am. And so I'm going to move away from that panel at the bottom, but it was it was a harrowing thing. This particular issue, it was a lot of emotional baggage that she carries around from the people that she could save and the people that she couldn't save because monsters are real and the the real monsters are not always the ones that are hiding under your bed sometimes they're the ones that are supposed to be there to protect you and it's not that kind of story don't don't get me wrong but it's still the failure of a parent to provide proper structure and proper delineation for a child to grow up in a world where they're not afraid, where they find themselves with choices that they shouldn't have to make. Because as a child, you're supposed to be innocent. You're not supposed to have to carry the weight of the world on, on your shoulders. And there's the two cats fighting in the background. So that... That proves well enough uh, to move along from something is killing the children. But hopefully with issue 41, when that comes out, then we'll get a new storyline. And maybe it'll be another long-form storyline, something like the Archer's Peak saga from the first 15 issues. All right. Almost done, folks. We've got The Sacrificers, issue 11, by Rick Remender, with art by Andre Lima Arujo, and colors by Dave McCaig. This book continues to get stronger and stronger with each issue. Um, the characterization, the world building is just on another level. This kind of reminds me of the early days of The Walking Dead. You know, once they, you know, before they got to Negan, but before, you know, not, not with issue one, but I would say, I would say in the early 20s you know, between 18 and 20 when they were in the prison. There's always, there's so many interesting characters here. And you've got the God King here who is searching for his daughter and is willing to do anything to find his daughter, including making uh, this character here go out and do another round of sacrifices. They, they are forcing the people to do another round of sacrificing their children to the gods. So, meanwhile, you've got Saluna here, not any relation to Salila in the other story, and she's got some sort of blackness within her. And she's befriended this little girl here. But the little girl wakes up and sees the blackness within Salula. Um, I'm sorry, Saluna, and it scares her because she's trying to help the little girl right here and get her out of there. And she says, no, no, you know, stay away from me. I'm afraid of you. So all this, all this comes from the very first issue where the gods have to have these sacrifices from people, you know, their firstborn, usually. And they pretty much drain them of their essence in order to continue their own life and stay young and vibrant and powerful and continue to rule. And that is the sacrifice of the title that keeps these elder gods in power and ruling over the, the other classes so the humans, um, then you see anthropomorphic, um, you know, animals and things like that in this book as well. But one of the most haunting sections in this is at the very end. Excuse me, I'm trying to get there. This was the second time that Father Palm had heard the foreman's flimmy voice. second time he'd watched as one of his precious children and were taken away from him. 
taken in service to a God who would never know his name. A God who would break every promise made in service to a world that gave him nothing in return but pain. So, Father Plume is the father of the main character that was taken in that first issue, the, the sacrifice that was taken. And he just sees the world continue to burn down around him with nothing getting better, apparently. So is the, you know, when they hit issue 12, is he going to act? Is he going to try to, to change the world as it is? Is seeing his daughter taken going to be what finally makes him stand up and stop being a simp for these gods? Is that what it's going to take to make him reclaim his manhood and fight for his family and fight for his children? And what's a stronger story than that? You tell me. All right. With Saga, we still have Hazel by Fiona Staples as the artist and Brian K. Vaughn as the writer. And she's still in the circus. But she's made a friend of... Let's see. Who do we have her? Emesis. And Emesis looks, you know, kind of like a spider lady. So she's kind of cool looking. You got to remember this title is huge in both scope and magnitude. You you seem to get even 68 issues in, you seem to get new and interesting characters and life situations and Fiona Staples artwork just continues to get better and better and better. Um we're nearing the I don't want to say the three-quarter mark because it's supposed to end at 108, but we're beginning to reach Act 3 of this. And so all of these stories that have come before are going to start converging. And Hazel is going to be right in the middle of them. So... See, things like this. She goes to touch her bangs, and she says, No, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got to think about it when people touch my hair. That's the kind of thing that makes characters real. That's the kind of thing that separates them from uh, just a character on a page and brings them to life and breathes life into them. Um, little things like that. Um, knowing that somebody's got an, an any or an outie belly button or that a character has an extra toe or that a character, you know, loved this other character that now lives uh, in Japan, you know, or on a different continent and they go by a different name because they had such a bad breakup with the main character that they don't even want to acknowledge that part of their life. Something like that is what really brings a character to life. And as a, you know, as a writer, that's what I enjoy the most, is seeing these characters come to life and be bigger than life. So Saga, now that, has, now that it has returned, is one of my favorite books that comes out, and I'm not going to say every month because it does not. But when it shows up, it is a spectacle, and it is deserving of its own time. Okay, and the last book that we have here is White Boat Issue 2 by Scott Snyder and Francesco Francovilla from Distillery. So it's one of those larger format books. And this continues the story. Shocking. Shocking all here. This, can sto this continues the story of Lee and Wade, who were brothers. That's cool artwork though I like that and Lee took the top bunk and his brother drowned in a boating accident years ago and he's always felt guilty for that he's always felt like it was his fault that something like that happened and 
these people that stole him away in the Let's see. Stole him away in the first issue and put him on this white boat to make a big deal about the white boat. They say that his brother's alive and his brother pretty much rules over this island and they go off into detail about the intricacies of... I don't want to say that's a cult as well, but the intricacies of the society that they live in and the fact that there was uh, the reason. They're the reason that the Bermuda Triangle became the way it is. Um, they had an island fortress. They have studied genetics. They've always been about a hundred years ahead of every other nation in genetics in science. And the big revelation that comes at the end of this is White Boat is more of a euphemism for what's going to protect you during a flood. And the white boat itself is not a white boat. It's not a yacht. It's not a super yacht. It's nothing like that, like you thought it was going to be in the first issue. Instead, they're trying to genetically alter things. And, and see, it says it's about forgiveness, pain, sadness, death. You know, God's challenge to us is to forgive ourselves from what we have come through before. And so the white boat is really an experiment to find forgiveness within yourself. And once you forgive yourself, in that moment I knew that Ward forgave me. And forgave everyone. In fact, all of us. But that's when the real horror began. So, he sees his brother again. That is his brother. But, it's to be concluded in, in book three. It's a really quick read, but it's got a lot of depth to it. And I really dug it. Um, a lot of these distillery books I've really enjoyed. Because the artwork, like I've said before in previous videos, is big, and it it you know as I've gotten older, it's harder to look at little tiny panels. That's why I enjoy reading Kindle on my iPhone. But at the same time, sometimes I've got to blow the panels up to really get the detail of what's going on. Because the phone is much smaller than even a regular comic book page, which is much smaller than a distillery page which is much smaller than the original page that the artwork was created on. But um, that is one of the most fun books that I've read from Distillery so far. And like I said, I can't wait to see how part three of three concludes this particular story. So let's see. Let's put that stack right back there. And I do have two books that I've got to read here in a little while that I picked up as books for initial assessment. And that is going to be Universal Monsters Frankenstein issue one and Rob Liefeld's Deadpool team up issue one from Marvel. But those books I'm going to talk about in a separate video, so I've got to read those separately from these. So guys, that is what my haul was this week. What did you think about it? Um, did you read the same books? Did you pick up anything different than what I picked up? What did you pick up and what did you enjoy? What was your favorite book that you read this week? And have you tried Saga? Have you tried Grommets? Have you, you know, if you're mainly a superhero fan, have you stepped out of your genre? Have you stepped out of your comfort zone to try other books and see how you feel about them? Thanks for joining me, guys. I know this was an extra long video compared to what they normally are, but thanks again for your time. Thanks again for your likes and subscribes. Please like this video if you take the time to watch it. Um, it doesn't take any time to sit there and pop that, that thumbs up but it really helps get the videos out to more people. And 
if I can get the videos out to more people, I can show more people about these cool comics that are coming out each week, and we can continue to grow this community and these books and talk about them each and every week. So thanks again, guys and gals, and we will catch you in the next video. Take care.